Hi, Brooke. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us today. Yes. Well, what else could I do on such a, a lousy, unsunny, <laughs> unwelcoming day? Where are you? <laughs> I'm just joking with you. <laughs> <laughs> the power of positive negative thought to be able to be in there. Is the South Shore foggy today? No. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little haze starting to form, but not at the moment. Ah. Okay, so I, I think we have enough uh, trust members to commence. Brian, if you want to open it up. Great. Um, as a preliminary matter, this is Brian Sullivan, the chair of the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust. Permit me to confirm that members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Brooke Moore. Here. Dave Iverson. Here. Rima Sherry. Here. And that's who I see for the trust. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Tucker Holland. Here. Great. Um, anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Judy Barrett. Judy, can you unmute? Yes, here. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Jen Goldson. Here. Um, and Tucker, should I announce the other members, Tyler, Catherine, and Barry? Yeah, I mean, uh, if Judy and Jen want to introduce them or? Great, I'll just, I'll just run through and then we can do introductions later. Uh, Barry Fredkin. Here, yes. Tyler Marin. Here. Catherine Dennison. Here, hi. Uh, and I think we have a member of the general public, Howard Dickler, who has joined us and will likely join conversation as well. Howard, can you? You will respond affirmatively? Sure. Great. Um, this open meeting of the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of COVID-19, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to, to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members and public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. For the meeting, the, of, um, the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust is convening by video conference via the Voom app posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, Please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noticed. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I the chair notes otherwise. Um, we are now turning to the first part of the agenda for this public information webinar. Uh, before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the member and registered participant, inviting each by name to provide comment and questions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. Please speak clearly. For any response, please wait until the floor has been yielded to you and state your name before speaking. If the members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, um, taking care to identify yourself. If there's any public after panelists have spoken, the chair will afford the public comment to those members of the public who have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their name and acknowledge by and speak through the chair. So from there, I will, um, Tucker, do you just want to turn to Judy and or Jen to make introductions? 
Uh, sure, or Brian, if you just want to um, get an approval of the agenda, then we can go into turning it over to Judy and Jen. Great. Do I have a motion? Looking to Brooke Do so I have a motion to approve the agenda for Rima and a second? Second. Second. Okay, by roll call, Rima Sherry? Aye. Brooke Moore? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. Brian Sullivan, aye. Great. Um, so just a couple of quick notes, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple members uh, apologize. Uh, Christy Grantella is running late uh, due to her new position, um, but she will be joining us. In fact, she has just arrived. Perfect timing. Excellent. Um, hey, Christy. Uh, and as well, Allison Mitchell uh, sincerely apologizes. She had an urgent matter come up and is preventing her from joining us today, but she wants to, the group to know she wishes she was here. Got it. Thank you. Um, Tucker, I apologize, but I don't have the agenda in front of me. Um, so I think if you just want it, we have a, the next section is public comment for anything that we otherwise wouldn't be talking about on the agenda. Brian, you may want to just ask about that, and then I would uh, ask you to turn it over to, to Jen and Judy. Great. Um, I guess I'll look to Mr. Dickler. Uh, I don't see any other members of the public unless the group joining us has any commentary or questions. No comments. Thank you very much. Um, so closing public comment, I will turn the meeting over to Jen and Judy. Um, Judy appears first on the screen. So if you want to unmute first and start and then kick to Jen. You need to unmute first. Having a few video issues here. So bear with me, please. I think I'm all set. So hi, everybody. I know some of you and hi, Brooke. Um, nice to see everybody again. Um, two of my colleagues on this, uh, in this meeting, uh, Tyler and Catherine are going to be working with me uh, on this. Uh, I'll let Jen jump in in a minute. But um, just to kind of explain the overall kind of structure that we came up with for, uh, for the project is that we're going to take the lead on the housing production plan, the needs assessment, the goals, the sort of strategies for, for the plan, we're going to be kind of doing the, the lion's share of that work. And, uh, and Jen will be leading the community engagement piece. So the public meetings, um, uh, the, uh, the survey, um, and Jen's also going to be working on um, most of the maps for the plan. So uh, we'll kind of work on those things collaboratively. But uh, the, the plan I kind of have is that Catherine, who's on the screen somewhere, I see you, Catherine, I'm not sure everybody else can. Catherine's going to be helping a lot with the data collection and initial analysis of it. So we're going to be looking to you folks for uh, information that we can only get from the town. And then, we, you know, we have other sources that I'm sure you're aware of. Tyler's going to be working with me on the actual analysis. Um, so that's kind of how we've we've broken this up. Jen, do you want to jump in and yeah, Hi, wonderful team. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm Jen Goldson. It's nice to nice to see everybody today. Uh, and as Judy said, we're sub consultants um, to Judy on this project. And so um, my team, which is me and Barry, and I'll Barry, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself in just a second. Um, we'll be working on the engagement piece and uh, and also doing mapping and helping with the land suitability analysis. So. Um, you know, I'm sure you've read our proposal and know all about our credentials and all that. Um, so I'm not going to go into sort of our background, but Barry, maybe you could just unmute real quick um, and just give a quick introduction. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Barry Fradkin and I'm a community planning analyst with Jane Goldson. I also specialize in GIS uh, computer mapping software and I'll be helping out with all the map development and uh, site suitability analysis using GIS data. Cool. Yeah, and you'll also see Barry on the focus groups um, that we'll talk a little bit more about that scope. Um, and he's going to help put together the, the community survey, which is one of the first things that we're going to be working on as well. 
So that's that's an intro for me, Judy. You want to take it back? Sure. Um, I think you've probably all read the proposal. I don't want to kind of walk you through sort of word for word on that, but I guess I did want to make sure everybody's kind of clear about uh, what we're doing and uh, and maybe even talk a little bit about what we are going to need from the town uh, sooner than later. But uh, I guess before I do that, do you guys have any particular questions that you want to ask us before I jump into kind of the scope and the timeline and some of the technical issues? Anybody have any questions? Okay. So the, um, just having problems with video guys, bear with me. You know, the first piece of any of these plans is always the needs assessment. It's really the heart of the whole plan. And so much of that is data driven. Um, you probably remember those of you who may have been involved in the last plan that a lot of this data is available from public sources um, and we'll be relying on that. I don't know if the data platform or any of the local sources that you guys are also working with may have information that you're going to want us to consider. Um, and if you do, we're going to sort of need to understand how you want us to connect with those folks. But really what we need to try to understand is what the needs of the island are. And because you're such a unique place, <laughs> um, you know, your needs are really kind of different, I think, from a lot of the places we work, although, you know, sometimes some similar issues do show up uh, on the Outer Cape as well. Um, but that's going to take some interview time from us. It's going to take some of the engagement work that Jen's going to be doing just trying to understand from the community what people think the primary needs uh, are. And so the first kind of big paper deliverable, if you were, the first thing you're gonna see from us is kind of, is the needs analysis. It'll be a draft of the needs that you'll get to, you know, review and tell us what you think we missed or hopefully tell us we're on the right track. Um, and then from there, we'll be developing goals for the plan. And again, if you were involved in the last one, this may be familiar to you, but if not, the goals section of a DHCD housing production plan really has two key pieces. And, and one is um, the, the sort of what do you want to see in future affordable housing developments in your community in terms of housing types, who you think the kind of the target, the target populations are, and what kind of housing is most appropriate for those folks, as well as the numerical goal that I know you're all very familiar with, which is the housing production plan target that enables the, the town to qualify for what's called safe harbor uh, if you meet that one or two year goal. And of course, what's gonna be a little bit interesting in this process is that the census 20 housing counts most likely will not be out before we finish this project. So we're gonna be relying on the existing numeric goals that DHCD has published for all, all of the communities in Massachusetts. We can try to estimate where you might be, um, but that can get kind of tricky because it's more involved than just how many housing units have you added to your community. In an environment like yours, um, if there's been a real shift between the seasonal and the year-round housing, that can make a big difference as to what that actual, what the actual 10% requirement is, and therefore what the, the numerical targets are for, for the housing plan. But you know, we have to go with the available information that we have. So that section of the plan is about kind of what the goals are. And the goals have to be conscious of, um, you know, not only the, the requirements just for numeric and, and the populations you want to reach, but you want to be thinking ahead to the other kind of big piece of these plans, which is the strategy section. And I tried in the proposal to lay out for all of you, so it's just very clear, there are certain requirements that housing plans have to meet to be approvable. And and so we're going to be wanting to talk with you early on and throughout, and probably even with some other boards uh, and or commissions before this is done, what are the likely and probable strategies that will work in terms of zoning that could be amended or modified to encourage um, multifamily and, and affordable housing? What are the town owned land opportunities, which I know you're, you know, you've been certainly involved in that conversation for a while, but where are the municipal properties that might make sense? Where are the locations in the community that you would encourage comprehensive permits? Sometimes those locations are the same as the places where you might modify zoning, or they might be the same as the town owned properties you want to discuss, but those are kind of key pieces. And then there's really sort of a, an almost silly 
requirement at the end that it's kind of hard to relate to Nantucket and it's sort of what regional initiatives will you do? Um, we, we can deal with that later, but, but those are kind of the, the, the critical pieces. And, and in between all of this, we have to really be clear about what you think the opportunities are for development in the town, because we certainly wouldn't want to put something in the plan that, that never is going to happen. On that note, a key part of the needs assessment is not only the demographic piece of the town, but it's also what are the needs you have in terms of adequacy of infrastructure, adequacy of, of available land for development purposes, um, adequacy of, of public services um, to, to support growth. So Jen and I are gonna split that up sort of because they're gonna be looking at kind of land suitability uh, assessment. We're gonna be looking at the regulatory constraints and between the two of us, we'll put, pull together what that part, part of the needs assessment will be. So that's kind of the architecture of the, the plan, the, you know, the, the, the plan that you need to submit to DHCD um, by, next, you know, by next year. But Jen, if you want to talk a bit about kind of how you're seeing the community engagement piece come together, I think that's fine. Yeah, that, that would be great. And um, I think it looks like I might be able to share my screen. Is that, am I a co-host here? Or? Yeah, it looks like I do have that ability. So let me, let me share the screen. I have a, um, a draft community engagement timeline that I wanted to, to go through. Um, so just let me know, is everybody seeing this timeline? You can just give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. So the, the, the project will, you know, really unfold with this community engagement. The idea is to, you know, start very soon, as soon as we can. And, um, we are going to run up a little bit into holiday season. Uh, although now that, you know, I'm sure people aren't traveling as much and things, maybe it won't be as difficult to get through that season. But just so you know, we are aware of that. And I tried to structure the timeline to sort of avoid some of the, the key weeks that would be, you know, more difficult. Um, but we can certainly adjust this more if you think, you know, there's other considerations. Um, and these were really just, uh, I threw out what I think could work in terms of a flow and how many weeks between things we would need to prepare and digest what we heard and things like that. But there's nothing magical about the dates or the weeks in some cases that I've proposed here. And so this is all on the table for us to discuss about, you know, if there's something else going on in the community or other meetings or you know what have you things that i wasn't aware of we can we can certainly adjust these but this is sort of the general flow um, starting with our kickoff meeting today the first thing that we'll um you know really be doing in the next few weeks is preparing outreach materials for the very first webinar and for focus groups um, as well as a draft community survey for your review and so um, you'll see some of those materials very soon in the next couple of weeks to, to really look at and, um, and go through. We'll send you a link for the draft community survey that you can take a test. We'll send you a preview link that won't actually count your answers, but you can basically take a test of it, test run to see if you, if you think the survey um, needs to be changed in any way. And I'll explain a little bit more about the intent of the survey and, and that kind of thing in a minute, but just to run you through sort of these main milestones. Um, then the next thing that will happen is by the end of the month, um, what we'd like to do, and Tucker and I and Judy spoke about this the other day, is to translate the survey into a few different languages. Um, and then we would also like to begin outreach for the first webinar, which we're proposing to have in that second or third week of November, uh, sometime before Thanksgiving. And we don't have a date, uh, an exact date pinned down, but if we could find a day within those two weeks, I think that that would be a good, uh, a good sort of flow for the project. And the the purpose of the webinar. This first webinar is really to launch this project publicly and talk through just why does why do communities even do housing production plans, what benefits does it provide, um, and really get some sense of needs. You know, Judy was saying it's really important for us. We look at um, you know, and Judy's team will do this and you know, very comprehensive way, looking at all the data and coming up with an analysis. But we don't think it's 
uh, it tells the whole story unless you start to really talk to to folks in the community. And so this will be really the first opportunity um, for us to hear from community members. Um, and so the way that we structure these webinars is we typically will have uh, an overview of the project and a you know relatively short presentation to kind of ground people in what are we doing here? What's the schedule? What are the components of this? What do we look at? Um, what are all the, um, you know, we also like to, you know, look back at the last five years since you last created your housing production plan. And what are all the things you've actually accomplished because you've accomplished quite a lot. Um, and then we structure it so that people have a way to engage with us. Um, we do structure it as a webinar, not a meeting, anticipating hopefully that there'll be really good attendance and a meeting wouldn't be as productive. Uh, but because of that, we wouldn't have a situation like this where we all have videos and we can just talk with each other. We would structure it so that people can communicate through Q&A, through chat, and through polling. And, um, and we create it in a way that you know, we'll get some back and forth a little bit to some extent because we'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so just asked this interesting question that I'm going to answer live for you. And I'm wondering, does this bring up any other questions from people or observations or, you know, other, um, you know, comments? And so it's, it's really run in that way. And that what we should talk about is, are there other panelists that you think would be important to have, including any members of the trust or other town officials um, or other, uh, you know, folks in the community that you think would be valuable to have as panelists with their video on and a chance to speak as opposed to participants. So that's a decision we can make in a little bit, but I just wanted to put it out there in terms of the format and the intention. Just before that, I'd like to launch the survey and it doesn't necessarily have to be on November 2nd. I think that happens to be a Monday, I think is why I chose that date. Um, but usually we keep the survey live for three weeks to four weeks and then we sort of check in and see if we think that a representative sample of the community or as close as we think we're going to get um, if we're getting a good response. Um, and if not, then we try to push on outreach measures and we can always extend that time frame. There's not anything necessarily magical about three to four weeks, but that's what we find is, you know, we put it out for a few weeks, really watch the numbers, watch the demographics of who's responding, and then work with you all to do more pushing on different communities if we feel like we're getting, you know, lots of, you know, folks of this category but not so many folks of this other category on the island and we really want a more representative sample so we'll sort of watch the numbers but my proposal is to launch that survey in early November I would like to launch it just before the webinar because I'd like to use the webinar to really push it out there um, and then we have scheduled or not scheduled but we have scoped rather five focus groups and i'm proposing that those happen in second to third week of december i'm trying to avoid later december but i'm also trying to give us enough room between digesting what we hear at the webinar and kind of crafting the focus groups but also i want to give um people a chance to get those focus groups, you know, to sign up for them and get them in their schedules. And I, I don't really want it crammed with the webinar because I think it can create a bit of a drop in response for the focus group. So I'm giving that about a month space between, um, between that. And we may close the, my proposal is to close the survey before that. It could be that it's still open because we're trying to get more response. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit flexible. But in terms of the focus groups, there's a few decisions to make. And I'll stop talking soon, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, this general um, approach. But there's a couple of um, ways to approach these focus groups. The idea is that you talk to small groups of community members. And by small, I mean anywhere from six to eight people at a time. So they're pretty small. It's I didn't count up how many people are on this, but it's smaller than this meeting. Um, and the idea is that it's not a public meeting, um, not because we're talking about anything secret or confidential, but oftentimes people feel a little bit more open to just talk to the consultants and say what they say what they'd like um, if they know that they're not going to be publicized. Um, and we take all of what we hear and really synthesize it. So we have a um, 
you know, there's some expectation that what people tell us will be relatively anonymous. Um, again, it's not that they're telling us something secretive, but at the same time, what we're really looking for is themes. We're not looking to attribute, well, so-and-so said this, and we're really trying to figure out out of all these different community folks who we just spoke to, what are some of the themes around housing needs and issues and goals that we can take away from, from this? And so the public document that ends up um, being produced by, by our team is a synthesis of what we've heard that really feeds into both the needs assessment and our thinking about goals and potential strategies and even getting into specific sites or areas. Um, and so there's a couple, knowing that that's the purpose, there are a couple of different approaches you can take to who you invite to these focus groups. Um, and it's it works both ways. And it's really a, a matter of uh, your kind of your local preference and what you think would work the best. So one way of doing it is you invite, um, you know, we would call them stakeholders with a variety of perspectives in the community. So they could be board and commission members from, you know, could be, a planning board as well as um, you know open space committee or conservation committee just so you can get some variety of perspectives on housing because of course we're looking only at housing but housing affects many other decisions in the community and other goals in the community affect housing and so you really can't uh, you really can't um, I don't believe at least you can plan for housing in a silo. Um, and so looking at what are all the different perspectives? Do you want uh, some representatives from the land bank? Do you want, you know, who do you want in these focus groups so that we can really get a broad perspective, uh, you know, the, the various main perspectives that you, that you see on the island come up probably time and time again um, when you're talking about housing issues and development issues. So that's one approach. The other approach is to do it by area or neighborhood. And so um, we're doing that right now for a client um, where we, we've divided, you know, the community already identifies through its neighborhoods. And so we have a focus group essentially for each neighborhood so that people with an attachment, either they live in that neighborhood or own a business in that neighborhood or work in that neighborhood, they'll sign up, or maybe they're a property owner in that neighborhood, they'll sign up or be invited to one of these neighborhood focus groups. So, the, so that's a decision that I'd like to get your input on um, today if possible. We have a little time to figure that out, but it would be good to start advertising that this is going to happen, you know, relatively soon so that we can set up a, a sign up genius and people can can sign up and we can pin down some dates. Um, and then after that, what you'll see in January is to really begin outreach for the second webinar. And the purpose of the second webinar is very different from the first. At that point, uh, the idea is to share some preliminary recommendations with the community and get their feedback through interactive activities. Again, similar activities to what I described in the first webinar where we can do polling, chatting, and Q&A. And we can even have some panelists, you know, some, you know, we can decide ahead of time, are there other panelists who we want to speak to some of these preliminary recommendations or not? You may choose to just have uh, the consultants speak to these ideas. So, um, you know, we don't have to design that that webinar right now, but I just wanted you to get a sense of where we're heading with that and the, the general timeline. So why don't I pause for a moment? I know I just spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, what I think I'll do is leave the schedule up unless people start to find it annoying that they can't see as many of your video faces on the screen. I can always take it down, but I'd love to just pause, get your reaction, get some maybe some thoughts around the, how to structure the focus groups in terms of who you would want to engage in that, and then maybe even talking also through about the, the schedule and just are these generally good weeks to pin down a date. We can actually pin down a date offline with Tucker, uh, specific dates, but if you think that these are generally good weeks and good kind of flow for the project, that would be something else that would be good to talk to talk through. So I'll, I'll just, you know, whoever wants to sort of chime in and Judy, if you have any other thoughts on the, on the, the schedule or the timeline or anything, I, you know, skipped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I want to mention, and I almost hate to bring it up, but I sort of feel like I must. So we manage expectations. Uh, we actually don't have our contract yet. So all of this, all of these dates are sort of assuming that we have a contract to sign like tomorrow, because 
um, I can't actually I can't actually engage Jen <laughs> until uh, we have that settled. So uh, if the town can kind of expedite getting that paperwork done, then it's going to make it a lot easier for us to actually lock in the dates. Having said that, I think certainly talking about the overall flow of this is fine. Yeah, the, yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Great. Um, Tucker, uh, assuming that's just at procurement? Yeah, and I, I reached out to Brian, uh, Judy and Jen and I spoke yesterday just preparing for the meeting and I reached out to Brian Turbot and Rebecca this morning and they are definitely working on expediting that, so. Thank you. Thank you. I, I so, don't know if it'll be done by tomorrow, but it <laughs> This afternoon would be great, so yeah, I right. appreciate that. <clears throat> Um, Jen, if you don't mind, we'll just work our way through the board members and kind of open it up to each one for commentary. Rima, you're you're the first window in order of my screen. Okay. Um, yeah. <coughs> as far as uh, people on the panel for the first um, webinar, um, the people that stick kind of uh, stuck out to me would be Ann Cospa of Housing Nantucket. Uh, Roberto Santa Maria, our, our health um, director, who is very tied into the community and also very, very busy these days. Um, uh, the superintendent of schools, because I remember the first time once Judy talked to the schools, she got a, a very different perspective and a more realistic perspective of the community. Um, um, possibly the hospital. Rima, yeah. if I may add on to that thought, just that our superintendent is now new. I don't know if there's another person yeah. in the administration with a little more history to okay. well, I don't know. join with an, in that group. In around. <laughs> yeah. Um, but schools, you know, that's this, that's that's our population right there. <clears throat> so important. Um, possibly the hospital administrator um, and someone from Habitat. Um, and then um, as far as the focus groups, I really like the idea of doing, um, doing neighborhoods, um, especially the neighborhoods that seem to be most impacted because of, that's where the infrastructure um, exists, like Mid Island, um, Old South Road, uh, so, you know, and those are the neighbors, uh, the, the people that tend to chime in and tend to object to things. So I think they need to be heard and included and educated. <laughs> so it's a good opportunity there. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, uh, church leaders for focus groups too, because they're also, you know, tied into Parts of the community that um, that aren't always involved in municipal stuff. So that's it. Great, thank you, Rima Brooke. So uh, um, I would think in terms. So I'm trying to think. You know, so so the survey is sort of broad. The webinars are narrower, and the focus groups are narrower in terms of participation. And uh, one area that I've had a, a paid a lot of attention to recently is um, having access for people whose primary language is not English throughout the process. Um, and we're also in the, in the midst of hiring, the town is in the midst of creating a, a position and hiring a diversity, equity, and inclusion director who will be a cabinet level position and that person should absolutely be involved in this process at some point. They will be new. Um, but may not be completely new to Nantucket. We'll see who it ends up being. Um, and, um, and I like the idea of Roberto being involved because one of my um, great concerns is how do we address illegal substandard housing as we create legal qualified housing stock? And, um, and how do we get a better understanding of the experience of our undocumented immigrants as well in their housing situation. That's a, that's a tough nut to crack. Um, multilingual will help and there are leaders in those communities that uh, can help us with public outreach that we should, um, I've learned more about in the last couple of years of how to, how to reach folks, particularly to get survey results. Um, 
as to the, I'm, I'm torn between the neighborhood versus like sort of um, uh, purpose for work groups, like because I think that sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a topic for a, for a focus group could be a valuable topic. Um, and so I'm torn about the about the neighborhood versus um, you know sort of organized topic groups or um, stakeholder. Uh, and that's it for me. Great, thank you, Brooke. Dave. I think the lovely ladies pretty much covered everyone. Um, I, you know, I think the neighbor, neighborhood inclusion, I think it, it is a must just in the sense that these are the people in the past that have um, thrown down the roadblocks. And um, if, if we can figure out how to get them in earlier and educate them, I think that that will help us in the end. Um, I think it'd be good to have someone from the Builders Association um, in our work group somewhere. Um, it would be nice if we could swoon some of those guys in to be interested in, in getting involved. Um, I know we've had a little bit of interest shown. Um, but other than that, I think that, that the ladies really kind of touched all the spots. Great. Thank you, Dave. Christy, Tucker, I see you. I'll come back to you. Just, I think it's mainly been covered, but I think if we haven't mentioned it, somebody from the hospital, social services, um, and then I was just trying to think somebody with uh, in the business community, maybe Melissa Murphy heading up the Chamber of Commerce um, could be another person to be on the panel. Uh, thank you, Christy. My, my thoughts, notes, um, I think planning board was mentioned through the process. Um, some other social service um, opportunities, maybe a, a director or somebody working actively at the food pantry um, I just lost my train of thought. Churches, sorry, Joey. Um, I lost it. It'll come back to me, Tucker. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, so, a, a few different thoughts. Uh, it, it, as far as the panel goes for the first webinar, I think it's important not to have you know, every housing organization represented on the panel, but I think to, you know, have the trust represented, to have the select board, I think we talked about possibly Gary Shaw from the hospital, um, maybe uh, Margaret Adams, or excuse me, Margaret Andrews from the Community Foundation, um, you know, folks who represent, uh, I can say, large constituencies of the population and the select board having made housing effectively their number one priority in their strategic plan a few years ago. It, that's how I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the panel. As far as focus groups go, um, I do think there should be like a neighborhood focus group, but not all focus groups organized by neighborhood. I, I think we would hear, um, you know, we'll well, if we have a, a neighborhood focus group drawing on the different areas of the island, we're going to hear um, those concerns, which it's important to hear. Uh, I, and I think we want it for sure want to have our conservation organizations uh, as part of that and perhaps also as part of the panel. Um, as the largest landowners on the island, why wouldn't we have them be part of this conversation? Uh, as well, um, there are a couple of organizations uh, that absolutely should be um, part of this, you know, perhaps, you know, in focus group, focus group format. Um, but uh, one is Tipping Point, which is the group that arose out of, you know, really out of opposition to the Surfside Crossing 40B. Um, they absolutely should have a seat at the table for the discussion. Similarly, um, although with different perspective to Tipping Point, there is this new nonprofit Act Now, um, which is well-funded and um, actually is a 501c4 
um, but you know, very active around quality of life issues and they're very concerned about the year round community, although at, at the same time concerned about the pace of development here. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. Great. Um, you know, what's what might be helpful to me and uh, Judy, I, we may have talked about this, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So hopefully this is okay. Um, but it might be helpful for me to work with a couple of members who, uh, you know, is really interested to help with this outreach um, component and, you know, kind of helping us design who should be on the panel, helping us make the ask. And I, you know, I think I'm sure Tucker can also help with this, but sometimes it's, it's good to have a couple of minds that we can sort of tap into to figure out, you know, how do we reach the, these different population? Who are the leaders in the, you know, the immigrant populations, Brooke, you had mentioned, and just helping us sort of, so we don't need to have a full trust meeting every time we, you know, need to make a, a decision like, you know, who's going to be on the panel and, and how do we outreach? How do we get the, the survey out to these different communities? So I, I wonder if, if you know, um, Mr. Chairman, or if, if, if you think that's an okay idea to have maybe a couple of members work with me and, um, and Barry and, of course, Tucker on the outreach and engagement piece throughout the process. I, I think that I absolutely think that's a good idea to create a smaller subcommittee that we don't need to post every time and you can be more efficient in getting things moved along down the road and come back to us. So uh, on that note, I think, uh, are we looking for volunteers? Is that the... Yeah, I mean, if people, uh, if anybody's drawn to that idea, that would be great to, to kind of pin that down now. Okay, well, Brooke was quick to raise her hand there. So right. I see Brooke's, um, I've got Rima and Dave both waving at me as well. So there's three, if we go one more, I think we'll push ourselves to noticing. Is that correct? Yeah. And that essentially is the communication subcommittee, um, the three of us. So it kind of fits in our... Oh, you already have a communication subcommittee? Yeah, we do. That's great. Okay, good. I should have just asked to work with the communication subcommittee. And there you have it. <laughs> Judy, you must be impressed from where the last time we all sat in a room together, we now have subcommittees. It's awesome. It's just great. All right. Oh, and I realized when you were all commenting, I never described, I skipped over what the survey is going to be like. So if I could just take it just a minute to just describe that so you're not here, you know, wondering about it, you'll see the preview pretty soon. Um, but basically, we, we feel that it's um, most useful to ask people about their perspective on housing needs from either their own personal perspective on their, their own story, their own um, uh, issues or their families' issues or folks that they know. Um, and so we, we structure the questions around, are you a, you know, are you a renter, for example? And it can loop you into, depending on how you answer that question, it'll loop you into a, a different section of the survey saying, you know, things about how affordable your rent is. Have you been impacted by COVID at all? Have you, are you looking to, to buy at some point in the future? And if so, are you looking on Nantucket or somewhere else? Or, and what are all the factors in that decision? Um, do you know anyone who has been homeless or temporarily homeless during the summer? Or, uh, you know, so we'll structure it in a way that they're giving us information about housing needs from their own perspective. But we're not asking them, for example, do you think the community should adopt such and such zoning, you know, bylaw? And because we're it, that's really not where we where we are at this stage. Um, we'll get to asking folks about policy choices down the road after we've really done this analysis. Um, and gone through the focus groups, and it's really more at the second webinar that we start to get into those policy choices, but it's not at the point of the survey. So that's what you should expect um, when, you, when you look at that. And so when we send you the preview link, what you'll want to do is answer, take it a number of times and answer questions differently to see where it loops you into, but also um, Barry has a nice flow chart that he puts together that basically shows you like, if you answered this way, you're going to branch off into this set of questions. And so you can sort of see the overall ma master flow of it as well. So, so yeah, I have a, I have a question that I'm going to look to Brooke to answer a portion of and then to you, but uh, I'm assuming as we work through these 
surveys, um, we'll prepare them in multiple languages. And will you have a, a native speaker be able to translate because sometimes straight line translations won't work in the opportunity? I think there's probably at least four languages I can think of um, uh, to be doing it in. And Brooke, I, I'd look to some of your experience with your other board, but Portuguese, Spanish, whether it's Bulgarian or Russian, I'm not sure, English. I, I, have, I have found we did a lot of translations in Bulgarian for the hospital early on in the COVID. And the feedback I got toward the end from, while that's helpful, many, many of our Bulgarian residents are proficient English uh, speakers. Uh, they comprehend it, it. Bulgarian is less important. The Eastern European languages are less important because their education system builds English in, uh, but certainly Spanish and Portuguese are critical here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely critical. And, and I, I think based on some things we've seen recently translate here uh, throughout the school is that they, that it's worked with, with a native speaker to, to write them or rewrite them versus just do a translation. And could we could we provide that service to to Judy and Jen? I'm yeah, I mean, we we did not include translations into the scope, so we would look to the town, um, if possible, to to provide those services. Uh, uh, so I would think Tucker that with Florencia for Spanish, yep. and. And Vanessa Rendero is a cert, now a certified translator, and she is a town vendor already uh, that has is set up with vendor status. So she might be interested in doing the work. So, great. Yeah, I think we can make that happen. Thank you, guys. So I think that's everything that I that I had. I don't know, Judy, if there's anything else you wanted to go over or if the trust has anything else they wanted to ask us. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, I need to put together kind of a laundry list of information I know we need. Um, and there are some folks I know we're going to need to talk to. So Jenny and I can kind of talk offline about, you know, who should be contacted whom um, it's I'm not worried about that today but um, I, I mean I can kind of funnel the information requests to to Tucker I don't think I need to go into that now so I can think of okay great I'll just say that uh, you know my perspective I appreciate the aggressive timeline um, I think we have a foundation and a group here that can work to accommodate it while group meetings may be a little trickier to schedule with the right doodle poll or however we decide to do it but I mm -hmm. do appreciate Judy and Jenny putting together a a fast moving timeline to get a result. Tucker. Yeah, and as I, I do as well. And, um, you know, and we, I've said this when um, we were uh, reviewing the proposal at the August meeting, but, you know, I feel that we're very fortunate to have the A team here uh, working on this housing production plan. Um, so we're, you know, quite excited to be working with Jen and her team and Judy and, and her team as well. Um, and uh, the question I had was, um, you know, we had said we want to be complete with the housing production plan by uh, May, mm -hmm. um, knowing that our present plan expires in October. And, yeah. and Judy will definitely recall last time, you know, it was shipped in in, in a rather speedy approval uh, with no changes. Um, certainly would like, certainly like a repeat on that. But is, is that, Judy, you think um, a reasonable, giving ourselves a reasonable amount of time in the event that DHCD does have comments or they may not be operating quite as, uh, quickly today as they were back then for a host of different reasons. Oh, I, I, I'm not really too worried about, I, I should, I don't mean this in an arrogant way. I'm not too concerned about DHCD's approval. I mean, both Jen and I have a lot of experience working with Phil Martino, who's the guy who kind of runs that program, if you will. 
if we have any concerns at all about whether something or another might fly, you know, we can talk to Phil. So I think we'll be able to give you an early heads up whether something is a problem. But I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I, I just finished a plan for another community a couple of weeks back and the approval was about as fast as yours. So, uh, you know, I just, it is true that they're all working remotely and it's harder, but they seem to be able to process things pretty quickly that are ready to go. Great. Thank you. I'd just like to, uh, on the, along that note, well, it's important to me to have a HPP that is great for DHCD and also now that we have a communication subcommittee and we're working towards more public opportunity, really looking forward to a document that is, you know, a baseline and shareable for the next five years and kind sure. of the working document for the general public to really understand where we're at. Sure. I, I understand that completely. You know, the, the only, again, the only glitch in any of this is some of those numbers are going to change. Yeah. There's nothing anybody can do about it. But. Great. Um, Tucker, do we have, or ladies, do you have other items that you want to address now? I don't um, think so. I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else. I always hate it when I get off a meeting, though, and I think, ah, I should have asked whatever. But, you know, that's what email's for. <coughs> Show a hand. Of board members, does anybody want to have a, any questions for our consultants? Dave, floor to you. I mean, I, I, just a concern about what happens when the numbers do catch up, when, when we do see the, the uh, census numbers. Is, is that going to be an issue? The only real issue, I think, um, will be to what extent does the uh, does the target change for housing production plan certification? You know, the a lot of the demographic information we're so fortunate now that we have annual numbers we can work with. Which you know I'm old enough to remember when that was not the case, and so um, I don't expect a big difference in the profile of the community or the description of the needs. It would be the number that you have to hit for housing plan certification. And frankly, you know, DHCD isn't going to ask you to amend your plan just to deal with that. You guys are, are going to just have to know that that number may be something else uh, a year from now. Targets may change, but everything else will, will stay yes. relevant. Yes. Yeah. I think the most important thing is to make sure that the strategies in the plan are things you can actually do. I mean, that's the thing to be worried about is yeah. we're going to put things in this plan we can actually do. Right. And and we talked about uh, yesterday, I mean, we're, we're in a much stronger position in terms of some financial resources uh, since the last plan to, to be able to implement things. Um, so we're definitely grateful uh, for that. And I think we've talked a little bit about, I mean, we obviously will see what the result of the census is, but here uh, it's just as likely that it might go down a little bit in terms of our requirement as it would go up. That's right. And, and in either direction though, you know, a swing of more than 25 units in our total requirement would be shocking. We just haven't, we just haven't produced it, so. Right. Brooke, did you have a comment? I think, I think what's critical to come out of this is, a, is an understanding for us of what's palatable to the community um, and desirable to the community because if we know that regardless of the target we just keep doing more or less of the same because it makes sense to the community because they're responding positively to the things we have planned um, or, or the strategies we're taking or we're getting you know, we're getting a, a hard, we're going to get in your way if you do this kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's going to be important for next year and for, you know, years to come. So, right. Understood. Christy or Rima? Yes, Rima. 
Yeah, I, um, uh, has the team been provided with uh, the work of Neighborhood First, um, all that documentation? I figured you are. And, uh, and the Nantucket Data Platform Survey would probably be a great um, thing for you guys to look at as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll figure out how to get that to you, you know, the, the actual survey and the results of that, because we had a great response mm -hmm. in the community to that, which, so uh, it's a good starting point. So you don't, you that's know. on my list. <laughs> that's exactly on my list. I'd like to see that's, that information. Yeah. yeah. And um, we're talking to them tomorrow, so we can kind of help move that along. Okay, I saw your hand go up there. Yeah, no, that definitely is going to be good information to look at. And once once you've had a chance to go through it, they're they're an entity that is interested to help more if they can. So um, your thoughts in that regard uh, would be helpful. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? I don't have time. Great. Seeing none, um, Tucker, do we have another item on the agenda or shall we close that item? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, I think it was really Jen and Judy's show. So if, um, if there's nothing more that they would like to uh, address today, I think we are, we're good to go. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for the non-regularly scheduled time uh, and all the consultants and your effort, you know, leading into the next uh, couple weeks and months. So appreciate it. Um, I'll look for a motion from a board member to adjourn. So moved. And a second? Second. So the second was Rima Sherry. Um, by roll call, Rima? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. Christy Farantella? Aye. Brooke Moore? Aye. Brian Sullivan, aye. Great. Thank you, everybody. Very efficient. We like those. And I apologize the baby didn't wake up. Next time I'll show her up. Good thing she didn't.